trip up Mount Hood turns into a rescue mission for a father and son. So it was intense. The role Governor Brown played in securing a deal to pass an education tax some Democrats think cost them way too much. Plus, it was a time when Santana ruled the charts and Russell Crowe toppled the Roman government. We're going to take a look back at the last time Rip City made it to the Western Conference Finals tonight on KGW News. Let's start with that deal in Salem. A business tax to fund education, a big one, is on its way to the governor's desk. But some Democrats fear the cost to get it there was just too high. Thank you for being with us. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm Dan Haggerty. Republicans are back at the Capitol now after skipping town for days, essentially to prevent a vote. Governor Brown, we've learned, convinced them to come back on the condition two high-profile bills are killed. KGW's Morgan Romero has a reaction from lawmakers. I'm going to recess to 2.30 this afternoon. After a week of this. The Senate is adjourned without a quorum until 11 a.m. Republican senators a no-show on the Senate floor and no vote on the contentious multi-billion dollar education funding package. Monday, Republicans and Dems struck a deal. So I was desperate to find a way to try to get them back. I had called them, I had talked to their leader, and I was getting nowhere. They just were dug in. The stalemate ended and the Senate passed the Student Success Act after Governor Brown and Democratic Senate President Peter Courtney traded two bills. And that's really what we were asking all along. It's just that uh, the voices of our constituents, we felt like were being ignored. And uh, so we had to do something to get the attention of, of leadership. Democrats dropped heated legislation ending parents' ability to opt their kids out of school-required vaccines for personal, philosophical, and religious reasons. An omnibus gun control package was also on the chopping block. It would have allowed businesses to raise the minimum gun buying age to 21 and require safer storage of weapons. I think it was important that uh, the leadership made a good faith effort and the governor made a good faith effort. We were strategizing for other ways to get the Republicans back and then the governor entered the conversation and the governor traded away the two bills. Senate Majority Leader Ginny Burdick, who sponsored that gun bill, says the sacrifice was a shock. Oh, I feel terrible, <laughs> you know, because I've been working on this issue for over 20 years. This is not anything I ever agreed to. Uh, but I was forced to accept it. But she says the risk of not passing the full education bill was too high. To lose the education bill on any kind of a, you know, of a gamble or a, a, a strategy, to risk losing that was not acceptable. Burdick says they had the votes in both houses to pass the vaccine and gun bills. In a sense, Republicans and Democrats won something. Maybe we did both win, but we also both lost. Most importantly, the institution lost. I hope it's not a precedent, uh, and it's, it was very disappointing. It was a real blow to the process. Burdick says she's already heard from constituents and gun control advocacy groups about how disappointed they are and how this all turned out. Meanwhile, the education funding package passed 18 to 11. It's now on its way to Governor Kate Brown's desk. I did pop into her office and reach out via email for reaction and comment, but I haven't heard back. For now, back to you. Morgan, we know you'll keep trying. Thank you so much for the details. Lots to unpack there. There sure mm -hmm. is, and this story is the topic of tonight's KGW viewer voice poll. Who do you think got the better deal here, Democrats or Republicans? Or do you think both won or both lost? Let us know at kgw.com slash vote. You can also weigh in on the free KGW app. Just tap on the viewer voice tile. We'll check in with the results a little bit later. Yeah, everybody talking about this right now, and this deal will certainly leave its mark on this session. Kristen Severance talked with KGW political analyst Len Bergstein to explain the significance of the education bill passing. Len, you called this the holy grail of education funding. Why? Because for a couple of decades, the Democrats and their allies in education and uh, really the uh, advocates for children's issues have been trying to find a way to get more money into education so that, in fact, our education system can have enough resources uh, to support the kinds of goals that we want to have. Uh, there's been a lot of debates about this, uh, and people have said, well, it's not a question of money, it's really a question of priorities. But I think the student success uh, 
process, the legislative committee that spent 16 months, went all across the state and found out that no, we really need money. So the bill that was passed was an enormous step forward. Right, the Student Success Committee heard all sorts of things during their statewide tour, classroom disruptions, which we've talked so much exactly. about, yeah. large class sizes, mental health supports, and this bill will really go to address those issues. Exactly, so the legislators who went around the state deserve a lot of credit. Then the legislators who run the two revenue committees, that's uh, that's Mark Haas, the state senator for, from Portland, and Nancy Nathanson from Eugene, really took, rolled up their sleeves and said, what kind of a tax measure will hit, get enough money but won't anger so many business people but it'll still get passed. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have this two billion dollar money. Plus we have some accountability factors so that the local school districts have to be accountable for the money. We fund some of the things that Oregonians know they want like Measure 98 vocational education and we have a variety of uh, measures that cut down some of our taxes. So it's a very big bill. It once in a lifetime opportunity for the Democrats to kind of get something really passed that they've been trying to do for several decades. Why did the Dems supermajority give up anything at all, the vaccine exemption and the gun control bill? Well, we'll see. You know, we're kind of learning a little bit more about it as each one of the legislators who care about those those bills um, kind of talk about the process. I've got to say that I think that the Democrats had a stronger hand than the Republicans. Mm -hmm. The Republicans got, I think, very little, uh, but they got something for their base. But I think at the at the base of it, what it was, was Senator um, Courtney is an institutionalist. I think he didn't want to break any arms and elbows to get the Republicans back in because he knew that if he did that, he would seriously hurt the institution of the Oregon Senate and that blow up might come up again and again and again before the end of the session. So I think the Democrats had a hard, a tough hand, a good hand. The, they may not have had all the votes they needed for the vaccine bill uh, and for the uh, for the gun control bill, but really I think the issue was whether or not they wanted to preserve good their not good enough feelings so they could work through the rest of the session, get some other key priorities done without a constant fight. Without a huge war. Exactly. All right, Len, so much great insight as always. Thank you so much. You're right. Back to you. We saw the we saw the battle play out, but but no war, I guess. And we've been following the issue of Oregon schools for months now. If you've missed any of Kristen's Classrooms in Crisis series, you can find that on our website, KGW.com or our KGW mobile app. The coin is flipped and the Curry family is officially a house divided. Right now, the Trailblazers and Golden State Warriors are facing off in game one of the Western Conference Finals, meaning Seth Curry and Steph Curry are going head to head. As far as problems go, I think this family has a one that I could probably deal with. My two sons in the NBA playing in the Western <laughs> Conference Finals. It's, it's not too bad, but the parents still did have to flip a coin to see who was going to root for hit, uh, who. Dad Dell is cheering for the Warriors, apparently, while Mom Sonia is going to be cheering on the Blazers, at least for tonight. We're, we're with Mom tonight. This <laughs> yeah, is the exactly. first time the Blazers have made it this far since the year 2000, and that's a series that still haunts Rip City. KGW's Orlando Sanchez is in Oakland for Game 1. What's good, everyone? Inside Oracle Arena, game number one of the Western Conference Finals. There is media everywhere. The place is covered in yellow. The atmosphere will be rocking as the Blazers make their first appearance on this stage in nearly two decades, trying to shock the basketball world. It's the first trip to this level for Damian Lillard and company. It's been a long time coming for them, and they believe that they can still win on the road tonight. We've been to the bottom. We felt what the what the bottom feels like. So to get here is, you know, it feels like a great accomplishment, but it's it's not it's not done. You know, we're not showing up here just to say we got to the Western Conference Finals. I'm just gotta be locked in, understanding that they're gonna go on runs, they're gonna make threes, the crowd will be into it, but you just gotta stay locked in, uh, make it as difficult as possible. While the Blazers believe they can get it done, it's business as usual for Draymond Green and company. They've been here before, their fifth consecutive Western Conference Finals back-to-back -back championships. Well, the Blazers are doing this thing for the first time in 19 years. Make sure to follow us live on KGW at 11 o'clock. We will break it down with highlights and reaction from Oracle Arena. Back to you. 
And from the Bay to Rip City, let's get a picture right now. This is a live shot Moda Center watch party in process as we speak. Uh, you know, these folks not letting a little bit of rain stop them from catching the action on the big screen down there. Art Edwards is down there as well, catching up with all of them. And we're going to check in with that and him in just a little bit. OK, let's turn the clock back to a time when the number one movie in America was Gladiator. Maria Maria by Santana was playing on the radio nonstop. And the Blazers blew a lead in game seven of the Western Conference Finals the last time they were there against the Lakers. Well, you know, not that that's a good memory, but that was my heyday. 2000, <laughs> that's when I got it done. Uh, a lot can change in 19 years. Devin Haskins right now taking a look back at the year 2000 and some of the things that have changed since the last time Rip City played in the Western Conference Finals. Well, year 2000 seems like a long time ago. Bill Clinton was still president. Tiger Woods would become the youngest player to complete the Grand Slam in golf. And the median house or home price in the U.S. was 152000 in the year 2000. Look to the future, all the way to the year 2000. Y2K had come and gone, much like the hopes of a Blazers championship that year. Shaw. And since blowing a 15-point fourth quarter lead to the eventual champions, there's been a few changes to our way of life. 19 years ago, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and almost every social media platform wasn't around. The popular way to communicate? AOL, MSN, or Yahoo Instant Messenger. GPS, used mainly by the military, wasn't available commercially until 2005. And speaking of getting around, TriMet's red, yellow, green, and orange Max lines weren't built yet. Only the blue line took you to the Rose Garden. Let's On the music scene, Portland's indie rock band The Decemberists were formed. A year later, they released their debut album. We're going to be celebrating our 16th uh, anniversary in two weeks. That's Voodoo Donuts co-owner Trey Shannon. The iconic donut shop that makes hex dolls with the opposing team's logo on them wouldn't start producing those sugar coma inducing treats for three more years. Voodoo Donut was still just a glimmer in our eye. The weather is beautiful. The and KGW's own Dan Haggerty was a senior at the Lindsley School in Wheeling, West Virginia. Oh! <laughs> it was your heyday. You <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> Uh, I got my old man on there too. Nice. You're welcome. <laughs> He'd be happy to see his uh, television debut. Yeah, so now they got to get through another California team. And, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah, we want a different outcome this time <laughs> yes. for sure. My face is red. <laughs> I just want to hear you <laughs> sing you. Two in the year 2000 again. In the again. year 2000. All right. I told you 2000 was a good year. <laughs> that was a good year. <laughs> Thank All right, you, Devin. Devin. Appreciate that. Thanks for All embarrassing right. me. Uh, <laughs> now, look, if you haven't been keeping up with KGW's Jared Cowley series on KGW.com, now is the time. We're having a blast with this in the newsroom. And, uh, a lot of people around Portland are. He's been simulating the last five Blazers games on the video game NBA 2K. And his game, his simulations, they have not been wrong, not once, if you can believe it. See how it predicted tonight's game by reading his very funny, very entertaining story on KGW.com. Totally worth it, and I think you'll be happy with what it's predicting. Let's go back in time just a little bit further to 1969. Lincoln High School students dig up a time capsule buried on school grounds 50 years ago. Plus, it's really fascinating if you can get over the smell, the Oregon winery using cow pies to make better wine. Well, we got some rain today, but it is breaking up and moving out. You can see on Doppel radar, things beginning to dry out. You can see over at the Oregon coast, some sun breaking through. I'll let you know how long that lasts. Here's a hint, not long.